Reverend Felipe Ribeiro will present the paper titled Interreligious History and Common Values, Guidelines for its Syllabus Development. Um, he is an ambassador of peace, Unitarian Universalist, Quaker Justice of Peace, Chaplain, Reverend, Minister, Royal Academic of Open Source Arts and Science, Heritage Safeguard Ranger, and Interfaith Cultural Diplomacy Developer, who was awarded by and cooperated with the most respective international institutions and networks, such as United Nations High Commission Commissionate and projects that saved countless lives. Um, Common Good is the aim of his research and works throughout his many contributions to the fields of nonviolent strategy, positive peace building, open ethics, rule of law, regulatory compliances, open justice, welfare policy making, humanitarian aid, solidarity economy, universal basic income, open source science, open access publishing, and the list goes on and on. I will um, stop introducing you here and you can take away and um, start your presentation. Can you listen to me now? Okay. Um, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Reverend Felipe. Uh, I'm from Brazil. Uh, and we've been working with uh, with the interfaith movement in Brazil since uh, 1978 when uh, there was one of the first interfaith acts in the global south region due to the tortures of the dictatorship in brazil so the the interfaith movement in brazil differently from the us or or europe where it starts as a a very congreg congregationalist movement in the Parliament of World's Religion in Chicago in 1893. In Brazil, it starts uh, much later, and it starts due to uh, an emergency. So uh, we have a different interfaith history, and this reflected very much in the absence of interfaith uh, institutions in Brazil, in Argentina, in Bolivia. So uh, when I realized that, I realized that we needed very much an interfaith movement in the global south. And because of that, I've been doing for the past 10 years uh, a research on the history of the movement, trying to, to teach people uh, from popular movements, uh, popular civil movements, uh, grassroots movements, uh, the importance of interfaith dialogue, cooperation, and diplomacy, most specifically. And because of that, I joined uh, Interfaith America, the Parliament of World's Religions, the United Religions Initiatives, and many different uh, international interfaith networks. And I was in the very beginning of the interfaith studies uh, area, uh, university research area, with uh, that was started mostly by Ibu Patel. I don't know if you know about him. He, he is the founder of uh, Interfaith America, which before was the Interfaith Youth Corps, which is one of the most important programs of interfaith literacy worldwide that started as uh, the creation of uh, fraternities and sororities uh, focused on interfaith sheltering for uh, university communities. And it started as a very small program in one university, and then and now it is in 400 universities uh, all over America, and some in Europe. We brought to one university in Brazil, and, uh, and the interfaith studies area of studies, uh, which is different from uh, the religious studies area, uh, is... Uh, very, very important uh, also, but it's it's starting. So we have it only in 10 universities, not, not more than that. So the thing is that uh, understanding the importance that uh, many authors have been positioning about the need for 
religious literacy for uh, the development of multi-religious educational programs, especially in secondary schools, uh, high schools. Uh, it the, the, the name differs from, from region to region, but this is a, an international need that we have. The, the development of multi-religious uh, educational programs. And, but to develop uh, the proper uh, multi-religious educational programs, syllabus, uh, syllabi, because it may differ as well from region to region, uh, we have to have uh, more proper interfaith principles of interfaith diplomacy. Uh, because up until now, we've been talking about, it is, we have been having a very large range of uh, this conceptual discussions, philosophical discussions in the area of interfaith. Uh, to begin with, the differentiation of the, the interfaith, interreligious, ecumenical, interconvictional that, that now appeared in, in France. And uh, and even others, uh, other uh, different uh, conceptualizations of this movement. And to make clear my position, and so you understand from where I'm talking, I will I will explain how I understand it. It is a it, it is a very big. We are in the very beginning of this question, but uh, I I believe interreligiousness, interreligiosity comes from a more institutional approach uh, in the field of, uh, it, it includes the necessity of the discussion, of the political discussions between the religious institutions. So it leaves out people that are only concerned with spirituality, faith, etc. Interfaith is, the, is the, the more encompassing one of them. So I will speak about it for less because it is my preferred one for the moment. And it is the, the, the one that is most being used. But we have inter-spirituality, which, which would include people that are nuns, uh, spiritual but not religious, and people that uh, have a, a, a more personal approach to the, to the relationship with faith and religiosity. The term interconvictionality, which is being used by the European Union right now, is more concerned with uh, the, the the participation of atheists, quasi theists, and uh, what is being called also as secular religiosities or sexual sexu secular spiritualities. So it would include agnostics, um, atheists, and other other as I said, quasi believers, which is a term that I I coined out, but I. I, I I, I it, it's still I, I didn't even talk about it, but it's there are people that almost believe <laughs> and, 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 and we, we don't have much study on this area. But we have people who study a theology and we have people studying theology, but we don't have the, the uh, studies in, in the in trans theology, as you would say, or something like that. So. Uh, these are these are all, 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 all very important questions right now, and and the thing is that religious studies uh, are more concerned with uh, with the study of each individual uh, religious tradition, or faith tradition, or spiritual tradition, or in the case of interconvictional uh, religious studies of atheological traditions, uh, uh, secular traditions, like traditions. And religious studies began in the first Congress of World Religions, which was developed exactly in the beginning of the interfaith movement. So there would be no religious studies cathedra without the World Parliaments of Religion of 1893. At the same time, uh, the interfaith movement its beginning in the world parliaments of world religions was one of the first voices to raise against the human zoos in the exhibition universal where it was developed so uh the interfaith movement beginnings is at the same time uh of 
a milestone for civil movements against uh, slavery, against racism, against sexism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the beginning of a new area of inquiry, which is religious studies, which is wh where we're talking from today. So this movement uh, uh, had a very a, a, a very strong difficulty in the Parliament of World's Religion due to the fact that. Uh, the religious leaders had diplomatic issues to solve. They couldn't speak anything they wanted to speak, as we cannot today. And the, because of that, they they had to, to, to arrange how would they find a way to do the proper research to find the, the limitations within their religious traditions and within their secular national regional problems to be able to talk about religiosity, faith, spirituality in the most proper way through their universities, their institutions and their politics. So the Congress of the first Congress of World's Religions will start a lot of different institutions, networks that still exist and that are very important. Like the the first one of them, the the Association of the International Association of Religious History, which is the first uh, uh, religious studies institution. Uh, to know more about the history of uh, religious studies, I recommend the the, the book by uh, I don't know I don't know if he's a bishop or archbishop now, but it's Julian Ries. It's called Religious Studies, and it, it, it is the most impressive view of it. And apart from him being a Vatican priest, he is very neutral, and he presents. Uh, all the different lineages, including Mircea Eliade and, and, the, and the religious studies scholars that went more to the animist uh, witchcraft approach to religiosity. So, the, so this area expanded the area of religious studies and the interfaith movement did not, uh, it stopped. The interfaith dialogue stopped for almost a century for almost a century, yes, yes, almost a century, and only after the Vatican uh, released the, the the Assisi movement uh, in the city of Assisi, which was the, I guess the the the, the second interfaith move interfaith dialogue meeting summit, we we didn't have many many dialogues, so I'd say that there, but with the exception of the, the raise of many institutions, local institutions in the United States, okay? So uh, the thing is that there is this renaissance with the return of the Parliament of World's Religions in 1983 and the, the, the post-ecumenical uh, acceptance of the Assisi movement interfaith dialogue from the Vatican, the interfaith movement expands globally, and we have uh, the, the establishment of a large diversity of institutions, which we, we did a develop, develop the, uh, 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 a database of these institutions and best practices to, to understand the differences between all, all of them. And the point, uh, uh, the, the most important point for me is that uh, it presented uh, the limitations of academic religious studies for the, the university scholars, the, the, which is, if each one of us studies the different traditions, it, it, it doesn't connect the, the knowledges from which the, 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 different, the different studies. So most of religious studies are, are very concentrated on solving one problem and they do not dialogue between themselves, which is a problem that I have felt in the area. I don't know if you do as well, that it's very difficult for, for one study to help another study. And the thing is that then 
appeared that this necessity of interfaith studies, interreligious, interfaith, interconvictional, ecumenical studies, the studies not of the religiosity in itself, the faith in itself, the spirituality in itself, but of the more uh, practical, daily, diplomatic, political, uh, humanitarian service problems that different traditions have when they're trying to do something together or even alone in a secular in a secular democratic state. So the thing is that the area of interfaith studies is, is in the very beginning, as I said, and my approach to the history was to, to develop as a database of the institutions. And one of the things that I realized studying the different uh, interfaith, interreligious, interconvictional uh, um, institutions worldwide, is the fact that every single one of them follows one very basic format uh, of methodology of procedure, which is the institution is the institution is born by a group of of different traditions of religions. They get together. They don't know what to do. They start doing fun things like group dynamics. They they hug each other. They do circular dance. They meditate, they breathe out, they, they, they help the poor, and then they sit down and they say, okay, now how do we talk about it? Because the, if we start talking about religious studies, it will end up in problems, which is the, the very beginning of the movement. So if, we, if, we, if I start to talking about my God or my lack of God, then you will talk me about yours and then somebody will get angry and then we'll get to problems. So this is not working. So the, all the different interfaith institutions, they got to this point where they said, we cannot be discussing our religiosity. On the opposite side, we must discuss exactly what we can do in common. So the very principle of the interfaith movement is finding common values between different religious traditions in different uh, regional sp specific missions uh, for different political purposes. So they all develop a very corporative uh, set of values and of methodologies. So there is always a mission, a, a charter of principles, a constitution, a, 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 a statute, and, and then they start doing works and some do better with their own principles and some do not work at all. So uh, we've been developing this, this uh, this research for a while. Now we're looking for finance to start an NGO to, to a, a, a research center to to do the proper data analysis of this of this material and to understand uh, exactly what is been working and what is not being working. And the thing is that uh, we already have a set of uh, uh, of ways to help interfaith movements and religious traditions and scholars who want to, to, to work with us. And we share best practices and we share contacts with the, the people that are doing the, the, the things that uh, have some connection with your work. So, uh, so if you're studying, let's say humanitarian aid in war zones, we know the, the five best manuals of interfaith dialogue with religious leaders in war zones, as an example. If you're doing hospital chaplaincy, the same thing, cultural heritage, religious cultural heritage, the same thing. So the thing is, we're going to try to, to connect better the community. And yes, I guess that's it. Um, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Felipe, for your presentation. Um, thank you for all the resources that you provided. Um, we will have enough time after the second presenter presents to have a group conversation. So please save your questions for that. You can even write it in the chat before you forget. But um, if you have any like quick, real quick clarifying questions, 
um, you can raise your hand or like virtually raise your hand and, and ask. Okay, thank you, uh, Esther. And good um, morning, good evening. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I was going good to morning. introduce you, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, good morning, good evening, uh, all of you. I'm Paulus, I'm from Indonesia, and I'm a doctoral student in a uh, faculty of theology, Dutawacana Christian University uh, in Indonesia. And also a uh, chair of standing committee of uh, religious education in faith communities in this organization. In this moment, I, I will present my paper about religious education in encountering water crisis. Uh, may I uh, share screen? Uh, all of you can see my screen, but maybe, okay, thank you. As we know that water crisis is one of a problem of ecological. So this con uh, these issues can be uh, debated conceptual and empirical as we know that it can be understand about the many kind of conflicts when we talk about uh, this issue. So the, the question is, uh what should we can do we must understand that water is a source of life whose existence becomes a uh, source due to truth on and capitalization as a problem and there are various of a uh, problem when we talk about water crisis especially we can understand about development of technology and women also play a role and contribute of overcoming water crisis problem and from government ethic in urban and domestic problem. And the question is, what does religious education must do in this moment? I started with the question is religious education uh, requires uh, theology as a foundation and integrated into the context when we analyzes and propose a proposal of understanding of uh, models of religious education. For the first, I will show about the mapping of the water crisis. As we know that water is a global crisis. It happened in all of places in the world, not only Indonesia, but I think there are many uh, countries also do that. Because we know that uh, time change pollution and uh, excessive waters can be the main of area when we talk about water crisis. Water crisis can touch uh, on economic sectors, but also there are many kind of uh, sectors in education and other infra infrastructures. When we talk about water crisis, we understand about there are uh, some conflict. Conflict is maybe consists about a uh, uh, military strategy, like uh, in Syria and Iraq. I'm um, group Syria, Iraq often control dump and water waste to plunder territory and population, and as a tactic in winter years. In equalities, when we use about this, there are many kind of problem of water uh, crisis. As the basis to solve and propose the models of religious education, I start from uh, water spirituality as theological foundation. Because as we know that religious education is a part of uh, theology, so it is need a uh, theological foundation. In various contexts, spirituality of waters that uh, have been uh, discussing in many uh, places like in Japan, South Africa, in talking about water and NSU, MNSU, Blaga, Romanian, spirituality, earth, and so on and so on. And not only it, 
but also when we go deeper into the Bible, start from uh, Genesis, there are a kind of as a part of discussion in creation. Not only it, also when we talk about a uh, water is one of the a basic element of the lives. We understand about the story of baptism as a part of primary sacrament in Christianity. Now we go on to Old Testament. There are so many kind of stories using waters. We can see uh, the story about purity of the priest and the object used in worship at the Garden of Eden, fertility, lives, and the deserts, and the story about Jacob and Rahel. Also, the many kind of the stories when we understand about the purity oneself from impurity, Micah, also uh, in Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, Noah and the flood, and many kind of stories. Now we go on into the New Testament. Uh, when we talk about uh, waters in New Testament, we can start from the stories about living waters that talk about uh, Jesus made to Samaritan. But we can understand about the story about uh, waters into wine at Cana, walking on wa waters, calming a storm at sea, and the stories about uh, Lord's Supper in some tradition involves water as a symbol of the blood and water flow from Jesus' side on the cross. And also in Revelation, talk about the rivers of water life is definitely flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Now I go to uh, how it the stories on the Bible and the stories about a uh, spirituality of waters to contracting the religious education for encountering uh, the water crisis. We start from the stories about uh, waters becomes an integral part of ritual and teachings. Based on the situation, we understand that water is important in the stories of the Bibles and Christianity. And now, it's conducted into the story about uh, from Aloysius Pieris show to us that there are uh, maintaining uh, Christian eunuchs to talk about how to uh, bring it into the stories about what does uh, God do in the talk about this. And it's about how the Christian must do when we understand the stories about the crisis. The stories of the Samaritan meets with Jesus in the checkup as a good part when I understand about how to maintain the water crisis because we understand that this situation uh, must be facing. Churches from religious education must come into this moment. To show that, I propose three principles. For the first is Water is source of life that needs to be maintained and preserved from now to the future. Especially when it comes to exploitation, water should provide life from the past to the future. Religious education allows for the presence of awareness that makes Christians willing to maintain water sustainability. And the second, Water is not private property that can be capitalized economically, but is a shared property that anyone can access. This understanding encourages religious education to develop an awareness of using water publicly for life, not capitalizes. And the third, water must be used wisely and responsibly without causing conflict in various fields. Water that is capitalist can enjoy by private parties can cause prolonged conflict. Conflict occurs because 
poor people become victims and fight for a third conflict. Or it could be that the other side, well, people who want to control it through conflicts. So conflict doesn't occur. By religious education must propose it. In my conclusion is water is source of life has been discussed sin, uh, since Asian religion, Bible, and theology. Awareness of perceiving it is an understanding that needs to be worked on in religious education. This work is also done through three principles, namely water is a source of life that needs to be maintained and preserved from now to future. Water is not private property that can be capitalized economically, but is shared property that anyone can access. Water must be used wisely and responsibly without causing conflict in first field. This is uh, my purpose about religious education must do. Thank you. Thank you, Paulos. Thank you for, for your presentation. Um, before we dive deep into the conversation, does anyone have like quick clarification? clarifying questions that you want to ask to Paulus? Um, yeah, so in the meantime, we got a question on the chat and um, Mary, do you want to address it or do you want me to read the question for you? Um, yeah, I can read it. I was, uh, this is addressed more to Felipe and he's already ex actually answered one piece of it. The Interfaith um, America, which began as the Interfaith Youth Corps, um, one of the things behind their process was suggesting that having people from different religious traditions work on a project together and then um, share a conversation afterwards would help each individual participant deepen their understanding. And one of the things that came out of that was the sense that Jewish and Muslim and Hindu participants knew their traditions. Christian participants tended not to. So it drove those participants back to their home spaces to say, well, what do I think about this? I'm wondering now we're in a world where a lot of people actually don't know much about what their home tradition might be. And so I was curious if there are ways in which the interfaith, interconvictional, interreligious world has thought about what do you do with um, people who either don't know much about their tradition or have some very bad misconceptions based on what's floating around in popular culture um, about their tradition as they can they enter into into this dialogical space should they and part of what well, you can see Felipe's answer partly was to say we need to do more religious literacy yes for sure but I'm curious because he had mentioned early on that it was politics and struggles uh, extreme emergencies that drove people to do this kind of work in Brazil. And I'm wondering if they learned anything from that that might be useful now to those of us who are also facing, or, yeah, anyway, that's the question. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, um, uh, the thing is that this is the problem that I arrived at, exactly. Thank you very much. This is the, the most important question. Uh, and the, 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 the two things I, I guess that are important on 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 that issue are the first one, the one that that I I sent first on on the chat, which is there is this course on religious literacy about Professor Diane L. Moore, and the things that they are doing in Harvard School right now, Harvard Divinity School on the plural pluralism project, and the religion and public good. Uh, project, which is the one that gives the courses of Interfaith America uh, online right now, is exactly the, the, the fact that they're trying to see religious literacy on behalf of peace building. So peace building, uh, peace making, peacekeeping is, is the, the core value of uh, religious literacy, because this is what uh, unites all religions. All religions have a face of violence and a face of anti-violence. So focusing on the, the non-violent part of religions is, is what is uh, a, 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 always a good start for my projects to, to say, you can talk whatever you want about your traditions, but 
not about violence. We're not talking about violence and we are not talking violently. So this is a, a common value that is really important for us right now. And uh, and apart from that, what one, the second thing that was important and that I just put it on the chat as well, is exactly the, the, the program I've been developing with the popular communities, the endangered communities on, on the fact that uh, we need interfaith literacy because it, it, what you're saying that is that sometimes we don't, uh, the people that don't know their own relig religion tradition, but most people don't know about their, their religion's tradition, interfaith diplomacy. And this is really, really difficult, you know, because there are Methodists in Nigeria that don't know that the, the Methodists in Brazil are interfaith. And so they cannot fight for their own right of being interfaith in the Methodist church in Nigeria right now, which is having a lot of problems because they don't know the history, the interfaith history of their own tradition. So we have a further problem that we'll need uh, interfaith history of each different traditions. So it, it yeah, a lot of work to do. Thank you. Norma? Building on Mary's question and also Philippe's um, response, the dis my doctoral dissertation was on the paradox of pluralism. Uh, there are many people who think the less I know about my own religion or the, the more I leave that behind, the more likely we are to all be not have a religion and therefore come to some commonality. And in my research, I discovered quite clearly that the ones who knew more about their own tradition and dug deeply into it, the uh, more open they might be because they would not so much fear the other in relationship, for example, to uh, water, the issue of water. If I don't know much about what I believe in terms of a creator God and water, um, uh, or then I might just fear the other who's going to come and take my water. Uh, so the idea of going more deeply into ours and then finding a trustworthy space to, as I say, be different together, a trustworthy space to be different together, we can both act together to find our out of our common values. Um, and we can also then work together on issues such as water and others as well. So I'm curious as to which either of our speakers or Mary might uh, respond to that. Yeah, so before going to um, Cheryl, can does anyone want to respond to what Norma just asked? I, I would like to 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 ask Paulus a question. As a matter of fact, on 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 this issue exactly, uh, how do you think that uh, these questions of water can 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 be more uh, researched in interfaith movements, Paulus, uh, so so that we can know more about them. Paulus, do you want to respond now or? Uh, okay, I think uh, we can hear Cyril first before. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to ask Felipe the question he asked Paulus. <laughs> so um, <laughs> whoever wants to answer it for me would be lovely. <laughs> the great minds think alike. <laughs> Yeah, so Paulos, and if anyone wants to jump into that question, please feel free to do that. Okay, thank you for this moment. Uh, 
I think that when we talk about water crisis can be elaborated into interfaith discussion. On my papers, especially on the page uh, second until three, uh, third, I propose about the many kind of the conflict that can be uh, happen when we talk about water crisis. Especially in the prop uh, in the problem about irrigation and uh, conduct with military strategy in Syria and Iraq and armed groups in Syria and Iraq often control dumps and waterways to control territory and population and it, as a tactic in warfare. There are uh, many kinds of stories about this. Because uh, when waters can elaborate into interfaith com inter conflicts and maybe in geopolitical situation, it not only uh, but it not only talk about waters per se, or because waters is one sub of uh, basic needed. When it can be excluded in the situation of conflict, so the conflict can be grow and grow. And this is um, what we understand about it. Because uh, waters is one of the stories. And Jesus started when talk about uh, the Samaritan woman. As we know that Samaritan and Israel's, or maybe in the stories of Jewish, they have a not good peace because they have a bad relationship. But started from the stories about the waters, Jesus go inside to solve the problems. Now, uh, in this situation, we can understand that waters can be uh, the source of conflict interfaith, and maybe the water can be a good part how to solve the conflict. So this is an uh, ambivalence of waters when we talk about water crisis. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I've, I've got so many things I'd like to talk with, uh, but I'll, I'll start with the, the water uh, notion. Um, the, uh, the whole notion of interfaith dialogue um, and, and interfaith work uh, I want to uh, separate out between local discussions uh, by local communities uh, about a water crisis, for example, that might be a, a topic, um, and uh, and the the structure of uh, wanting to look at it uh, as a, an interfaith uh, dialogue about religion. Um, and so there's this tension between uh, the lay, the local people talking together uh, and acting together in a way to solve a problem uh, as distinct from uh, people doing an intellectual exercise of interfaith discussion, which we tend to call uh, interreligious dialogue or religious studies. Um, I worked uh, for a, a number of years in the state education system uh, in Queensland, and we developed a curriculum that was suitable for use by all religious groups. It was a curriculum for primary or elementary school right through to uh, year 12 high school. But it was based on a particular model, and I wonder if this model uh, can be helpful. Uh, it has three circles. The first circle is everyday human experience, and the water crisis is one of those experiences. And so examples around everyday life. But at the heart of that circle then are the ultimate questions that arise out of that problem. And it's those ultimate questions that are answered by the religious traditions the traditional belief systems. And in those traditional belief systems, on the outer circle, you have stories and rituals, but in the inner circle, you have doctrines and teachings, key teachings. Uh, 
but there's a third circle now that whole notion of religion and life uh, is very it was very common but we introduced a bottom circle a third circle which was the individual patterns of belief uh, that the the students and the teachers brought to the classroom to the discussion and at the heart of that were personal discussion uh, personal beliefs and attitudes and so we said that religious education was a, a, a process of interacting, of, of looking at life experiences, asking what the big questions are, having a look at the religious traditions and, and what their key teachings are and how they might interact with one another, and then helping the students uh, uh, in the classroom to talk about and develop what their own personal beliefs and their reactions would be. And so it's a dialogue, an interaction, uh, a, a process um, rather than... And, and so the key question, I think, for this whole area of interfaith dialogue is, is actually what's our, what's our long-term goal? What's our, what's our hope, our expectation? Is it to uh, minimise conflict, uh, peace, peacemaking processes? Uh, is it to uh, develop empathy? Uh, with one another to see the similarities and differences. Um, I, I'm fascinated, uh, Paulus, that I, I believe in, in just about every religious tradition that I've heard of, water is a key element uh, and, you know, there's a sacramental element to it. So it, it depends on where you want to start. You could start with the human experience problem or you could start with the religious traditions and say, how do they relate to the, the life experiences? Um, when, when we were looking at uh, different ways to handle the varieties of religious belief that might be in a state school, a public school classroom, uh, that variety, um, the questions were, in the United Kingdom, a lot of work had been done by people like Ninian and Smart on, uh, on religious studies, comparing the different religious groups, and that was comparative religions. Uh, now, interfaith is very different, uh, Felipe, as you've been talking about. It's not so much looking at the phenomena of religion, which was Smart's major work, um, but or categories but rather the, the way that we conduct dialogue. Uh, and I, I think it's that openness to dialogue, but you sometimes need to have a kind of model to say, well, what's the end process? What are we really looking for here? And that might differ in different places uh, according to the dialogue. And I love, Felipe, the, the variety of charters and the variety of common values. Um, but I, I would encourage you to, to think about um, the, the very purposes of the dialogue uh, and, and the ways in which uh, you can maintain um, uh, empathy and talking. Uh, and so we developed uh, a process that said, if you want to talk about your beliefs, you need to own them. These, this is what you know. I personally believe that water does bling bling or you ground it. Roman Catholic people believe, Jewish people believe. Um, so the grounding or the owning of the beliefs and, and helping people to understand the difference between a fact type statement about, you know, uh, Jesus said this in the Bible, that's a fact type statement, as distinct from a belief type statement, that, that which is we believe. Um, and I, I think that concept is a terribly important one in any kind of interfaith discussions. Uh, and so I've been involved in especially uh, Jewish, uh, Islamic and Christian dialogues, especially at times like um, the Iftar uh, celebrations or um, my, my local church in New York. Um, has has been doing uh, these conversations once a year uh, and, and choosing just a small topic. So if you can just choose a small topic to deal with, you're not trying to do it comprehensively. You're just saying, okay, let's talk about 
the conflict of water uh, at the moment in Indonesia and, and where the conflict is and explore that. So anyway, that's some of the stuff. Uh, I've talked enough. Felipe, please. Ms. Nolan, thank you very much. Uh, the questions you're bringing, uh, they're very much in a, uh, a very important book by Professor Catherine Cornell, which is called The Impossibilities of Interreligious Dialogue, which uh, will present exactly uh, these difficulties. And uh, uh, she presents the opposite side too, which is the fact that many local interreligious movements start doing things and they talk and they have very good intentions and they do they do nothing with that, and so uh, and we have uh, uh, the data and the experience of interfaith international movements show that we have uh, the interfaith movement is an elders movement most. Uh, FBOs in general, faith-based organizations in general, are, are over 60 years old. I'm 40 years old and I'm the youngest always wherever I go and I'm not that young anymore. And the thing is that we are not being able to really gather and, and to engage the, the, the youth community in, in these dialogues. And bringing the, these, these uh, stories is really important, but the kids really like to, to have the adventure of participating in this big history of this important movement for them is, is, is something that they, they always tell me it's super cool. <laughs> so I just wanted to leave that. Thank you. Uh, Lauren? Uh, hi, um, thank you for this is all really amazing. Um, the presenta presentations and the questions. Um, I, I I think when Elizabeth was talking and you mentioned the three circles, it reminded me of something I did. I taught kids um, for a long time out of my home, a Sunday school in my home because I couldn't find one that I really um, that that would work for my kids. And it's sort of like, um, the necessity was born out of an interfaith marriage and then knowing a lot of other people like me who had kids from two different parents traditions and where do you send them where do you go so I created my own program and it ended up I I had three circles in my model <laughs> one was the home religion that I was teaching and in my case it was Judaism but the partner was usually Christian or some form of Christianity, but also we had people interested in Native American, uh, Buddhism, Islam, you know, there were a lot of, there were strands of different religions coming through. So my second circle was an interfaith orientation. So I was teaching kids from a very young age to, um, to teens and small classes, like four kids in a class. And, you know, it was, this was not in a public school, like this wasn't RE in a public school. So it was a little bit of both confessional and practical. And, you know, I, I never told the kids what they had to believe. It was always, this is what the tradition. So I appreciate the difference between fact and belief, but even saying what, uh, your tradition believes, I never said they had to believe that. It was very open. So it was, what's the home religion? And the interfaith orientation was, let's look at all how other religions do this. So if the home religion is keeping kosher, what do other religions do? What's the Hindu practice with diet? What's the Islam pra Muslim practice? And so they would learn that way. We also did a lot of religion tours where we went to different other places of worship. We even went to other classes of other religious schools. Um, and I think the kids really enjoyed it. The other thing is I added a cultural dimension to make sure that we were up to date. What's going on? What are the latest movies out about culture? You know, like my big fat Greek wedding had come out at that time. And so things like that, that were fun and um, got their interest. So, and then my third circle was 
a set of principles um, that were guiding me as I was doing this. And I think it comes down to, you know, kind of what you're talking about with the, what's the goal? What, it, you know, is this to avoid conflict? Is this peacekeeping? Is, um, and, and how do those principles guide us? And I, what I, what I'm realizing now from this conference is that we're really, well, I, I realized this before. I think my approach is evolutionary, that we are trying to get into a new worldview. And that's the rub right now. We need, and, and I think it's that, that worldview, that new worldview that's going to answer the, some of the questions raised here by the presenters of how do we get to those common values and so that we can deal with crises like water, which is global. So um, I don't know. I think I, I've been telling Mary Hess for years that I need to write a book about what I did. <laughs> but I guess I have to talk to someone about it, but this is my first time talking. So thank you for letting me share that. This is extremely inspiring. And I think, um, I hope that the interfaith movement gets younger. So Sounds great. Well done. Thank you. We look forward to that book coming out one day. Um, I have, I see a couple of questions, mostly by Cheryl on the chat. Do you want to unmute and ask the question, Cheryl? Sure, I can answer. Um, the, yeah, Dr. Felipe, you just um, opened my eyes and made me think about um, water as a resource and having parliamentarians or governmental officials be responsible for portfolios around dialoguing in order to address the pre prevailing issues. Does this happen? I'm not very well versed in government matters or how they operate, but do you know that this happens? And then secondly, what is the greatest need that you have right now? What are you hoping to see happen as a result of your sharing this with us today? What is your next need? Shario, thank you very much. Uh, we do have a vast ecosystem of interfaith ecological movements. Uh, I, I'd, I'd put the most important one is Faith for Earth from the United Nations Environmental Program, of which I am part of. But we, ha we also had one that uh, was really important in Brazil and the one that got me uh, persecuted in Brazil, which is the Interfaith Rainforest. Others, many, many others. And uh, bringing interfaith dialogue to governments internationally, I would say, is one of the most important things for the movement right now. We already got to establishing interfaith high commissariats in the United Nations, but now we need interfaith ministries to be developed. And this is... Uh, I don't have a, a programs yet on the issue. If you find some, please contact me on my email or, or, or social networks. But uh, I, I think this is this is really the point that we arrived in Brazil, and this is uh, the next states will have. Uh, as an example, so, so that nobody say this is uh, hippie talk, <laughs> uh, the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation, which is connected to the G20 and the World Bank, which is connected with Intel, Google, and all the big companies, it is saying in workplaces is the next most important DEI 
instance for workplaces. DEI is diversity, equ equity, inclusivity. So we are not to, we cannot, Brian Green, the director is saying, we cannot have anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-LGBT talk in corporations if we are not talking about interfaith diplomacy in these places. So we've been doing uh, private NGOs, even NGO, which is United Nations, but governmental, it deals with rule of law, a lot of legislation, and we still don't have uh, enough scholars to think about it. It is studies. Thank you, Cheryl, really. You're welcome. What would have to happen for that to happen? What you just said. What would need to happen first? I think to see uh, that? Uh, an United Nations interfaith uh, recommendation for interfaith dialogue would be the first step. I tried to do it in the... Now I'm really tired. Of has many different religious traditions, lobbies. Relation for some established groups. International diplomatic issue. There's, I guess, interfaith literacy to begin with. Uh, the, uh, we need we need uh, interfaith literacy to become something as popular as culture. We talk about culture and going to the museum as something natural. In something natural, at least in in the capitals of the civilized world, as they call, it. to have assume we are uh, the interfaith civilization we say we are, and we are not doing it properly. UNESCO is not doing it properly. The the global north, first world countries, governments don't. So it takes uh, it, it takes political power, and we we never had uh, an interfaith president. Let's say it like this. Thank you. Um, Cheryl also left to Paulos that she wishes to express her gratitude for you. Broad treatment of water from a theological perspective and your integration of its relation to other discriminations as Melanie Harris challenges us to consider yesterday and your writing style was accessible and eye-opening. So thank you, Paulus. Um, I saw a hand, Elizabeth. Yes. Just to remind us all that in fact, Felipe, the Religious Education Association is in itself uh, a way of being an interfaith organization and we hold those diversity uh, concepts uh, and respect for one another um, uh, very very close to our hearts and so i'm really pleased to be part of this um, historic organization you know from 1903 arising in particular perhaps out of the uh, the parliament of world religions but um, it's great to know that we're part of this um, this movement, uh, and we we're glad to have you uh, as part of uh, sharing with us. Thank you for your papers. Norma. Um, I was wondering what some of you think about interfaith work dialogue, diplomacy uh, as an alternative to individual nations almost worship of their nationalism, uh, which can lead to competitiveness 
For example, in the United States, the rise of Christian nationalism, which assumes white supremacy, which assumes the supremacy of the United States, uh, which then leads to disregard for issues of small island nations, for example. Um, in other words, collaboration rather than competition or assumptions that our way, our nation is better than any other. Um, now, we know that religious uh, conflict is not helpful, but when we've been talking about interfaith diplomacy and common, working for common values, that seems important to pursue rather than um, national competition or supremacy. I'd be interested in your anyone's co comments. Very true. We yeah, thank you. Know, you we need it. to do that, uh, Paulus. And then uh, thank you for your sharing, uh, Elizabeth and Normal, uh, in the in the last uh, discussion. Uh, I think that when we hear the real statement from Elizabeth and Norma, I think that that we need uh the real action about interfaith dialogues and maybe can be start uh, by elaborate about uh, not only in peacemaking but also we can elaborate it into the uh, psychological aspect because uh, when we start from psychological aspect maybe the stories from Norma when talk about uh, interfaith works as an alternative to nationalism can be grow up on and be flourish. I think this uh this is very important when we talk about it, uh especially for discussing about it. When it uh elaborated into water crisis, as we uh as I tell in the past, the the water crisis uh can be important because it not uh, talk about ecological aspect, but can be correlated with psychological, economic, and welfare, and many aspects. So uh, this crisis can be go deep because this is not only just an issue, but it is just, it's elaborate with our lives. And we can do many things, not only talk it, but also we can do many things this is more important to understand about this situation uh, i think about it go on to lauren maybe um so norma your question about nationalism um i think you know i had a specific case in my teaching being jewish one of the reasons I, and i don't want to get into politics, but I guess I have to. Um, one of the reasons I wanted my own Sunday school is I did not want to teach the Zionism that comes with the Judaism of my generation. Um, and I personally feel that I was raised not so much with Judaism, but with what is being called Israelism. And that is a form of nationalism and Zionism. And we can see where that goes by looking at the state of Israel today. So yeah, there's a big reason to be concerned if Christianity goes in that direction in the United States. Um, so, you know, I came up with a way to teach Judaism without including Zionism. I didn't even know if my students were aware of it at the time, but one of them is now in his 20s, and he's a history uh, graduate student. And he told his mother, who told me, I'm so glad I had a Hebrew school that didn't teach Zionism. So obviously, it did get through. Um, 
So um, I, I think this is another reason why we need religious education and interfaith literacy that um, that we that people can understand, students can understand there's another approach. We don't need the, the nationalism. And I know that nationalism, nationalism of any form anywhere was said by uh, by the historian Howard Zinn, no relation, although maybe there's a relation, I don't know, Howard Zinn's book on uh, the people's history, who said that was the biggest danger to the world uh, is nationalism. So I think it's a, a really um, important you know, thing to be aware of in, in terms of how we teach. And this comes back to what um, both Felipe and Paulus are talking about is this intersection too between politics and religion. And I think you we we can't ignore it. We, we but that spiritual piece is, I think, could be. I think your question about could interfaith literacy be an alternative to nationalism? That's that's brilliant. Like, let's do it. <laughs> so. Cheryl. Thanks, Easter. Um, I'll just quickly, well, I don't do anything quickly, but I'll just try to quickly say um, I appreciated Norma's question and what Lauren just said. It would be wonderful if children in school learned that if you are a nationalist or if you are a child who believes that the way you do things is better than your neighbor, or the way that you look is better than your neighbor, or the way that you believe is better than your neighbor, or the things that you do is better than your neighbor. And then you decide to hoard a resource like water or food, and you acquire means and weapons to make sure that you get what you know, what you want. Do you know what you're going to, to create? you're going to create war. And if children realize that this selfish, um, egocentric, nationalistic, um, capitalistic way of acting will divorce them from other createds, other relations, the earth, I wonder what they would think about that. So I thank you both Norma and Lauren for bringing that up and the, the importance of that in terms of starting young, as Lauren said. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl. Felipe, please go ahead. I to point out two important facts for uh, our American friends, but um, faith dialogue I think is at the same time breaking out very really. international because religions are very international. We cannot forget uh Jesus uh when he he couldn't stand his his home in Palestine, Israel, he he fled. His family fl fled to Egypt. National, and and all religions they they, they don't have a, a merely national history. They all, it's very difficult to find one tradition that is really only local. Um, but. That faith movement itself, they have this very specific uh, local traditions as well. So that uh, from my research, I would say that the, the modern institutional interfaith movement is North American, if you want. It is, it is American. And this can can also lead to 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 a way of talking to nationalists that the the, the very nation you are defending it, it, it is is an interfaith uh, 
founding fathers of America were Freemasons and and uh, denominations and traditions. And they were many of them were inter. So it seems important to get that also. Lauren? What, are, are you saying that the interfaith movement is or can become a national, a form of nationalism? Well, that we need to be careful? That is a danger. Uh, this uh, the, the uh, interfaith dialogue was a flag from the Yankees. Uh, it was the this was one of the things that differentiated in in, uh, in, in United States. It 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 is a reason for war. Uh, the the way that interfaith that this kind of dialogue in culture and media has to do with that. that uh, but the thing is that not talking about it is not solving either. Huh? The when when we're talking about uh, spiritual but not religious, this is uh, uh, opposite of interfaith. Q uh, conspiracy theory. The things that you say globalists are evil and we don't we hate the United Nations and the Illuminati plan to rule over America. Uh, which is the only way to, to reply to that? No, my friend. You have to study the history and study the history of the interfaith movement. Major traditions, even even evangelicals, you know, even uh, uh, Billy Graham was part of any. You know, we're not talking about only about hippies from uh, uh, from the far left, as they say. We're talking about conservatives in the interfaith movement. In if we don't talk, but if we don't give this literacy of the evangelicals in the interfaith movement in the Bible Belt. We won't be able to stop QAnon people to say that there are Illuminati evil people in the United Nations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and so I think it is a danger, and because of that, we must not leave it alone. We must talk about it exactly because it is so dangerous. Norma. Perhaps 30 or 35 years ago, uh, when I was teaching at Wartburg Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa, um, Dubuque is on the Mississippi River, <laughs> uh, we had in our local city, 60,000 people, uh, a task force on studying about religion. There is a long history of public education in the United States, which has a commitment that all, whatever race, nation, national ethnic background, economic class, need an education uh, to sustain a democracy. And at that time, um, there was um, teaching religion in, in some of the schools. And we worked very hard over two or three years to uh, study how we might in the public schools where children are together, teach, learn about religion, learn about different faiths, different celebrations, uh, different beliefs, uh, rather than teaching a faith um, and and we succeeded uh, and we had to develop strategies of how to do that uh, but it was important now today in the United States there is a big um, conflict and even here in the state of Iowa 
uh, of removing money from the public schools and putting it into tax vouchers that people can uh, teach whatever they want to on their own and forget about all the rest. For example, to have a private school which only lets in certain races or does not is not welcome to people with disabilities uh, or having a school that teaches the political right um, or banning books. Um, so this, this whole uh, issue has come up again and I'm very invested in this, uh, which does talk about learning about the other Rather, people in the United States often are saying, we have so many divisions and oh, I can't do anything and whatever, but working together to have a place where we can learn about the other, particularly young people uh, growing up. And so I'm very committed to that. But I'm just saying that what we did 35 years ago worked. Uh, and now we're back, it's like, this is all being dismantled. So we have work to do. Uh, Thank you all for sharing. Um, we are about seven minutes I away. I think I heard something from Felipe and then I saw Elizabeth had. So if you two could um, say something real quick, Felipe. I, I just wanted to say that uh, the very dangers that the ecological movement that Paulus is talking about and the interfaith movement that we are talking about is leading everyone out of these movements. And, and the thing is that the youth is afraid and at the same time bored of, of, of being with us on this discussion. Just, just that, thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. I merely wanted to say, I'm sad that we, we don't have many from the United Kingdom uh, because uh, the the need for interfaith dialogue and multi-faith religious education uh, particularly came up because of the conflicts within UK society and European society. And so when we have uh, representatives uh, coming to our uh, REA conference and talking about the way in which they do religious education uh, in uh, the European countries and in the United Kingdom. Um, again, they're diverse ways, but but the same issue is, is how do we create uh, an educated uh, populace so that uh, democracy or justice uh, and freedom and, and interpersonal respect, and then uh, for us now, uh, a real concern for uh, the planet and, and our our ultimate respect for uh, the earth and all its creatures. Um, I think that that need to come together um, and to be aware of uh, where our ideologies actually, as my prof Will Kennedy would say, it's our ideologies that are driving us apart uh, and we need to challenge those ideologies. Thank you. Um... Does anyone have any pressing questions or comments that you want to make, Lauren? Well, I'm just, you know, the whole theme of the conference, Dear Earth, and there is, it's, um, how is that showing up here uh, in terms of a new worldview? And, and I'm thinking that this indigenous worldview that underlies dear earth or at least that's how i'm feeling it to me is maybe where we need to go as as a species and, and evolutionarily um giving more personhood to plants and the planet and the animals and less thinking of ourselves as the top of the of the chain you know um and i i guess my question really for felipe and and, and Paula really is, um, can, can we see maybe the indigenous worldview as something as like sort of out of the, the sort of umbrella out of which our interfaith literacy and our 
uh, water crisis solutions can be kind of, kind of live in there. And then can we be sure that the indigenous worldview doesn't turn into some kind of nationalism? How do we, I'm, I'm really nervous about that now. So is the, is the indigenous worldview immune to nationalism? <laughs> Thank you for your question, Lawrence. I will tell about the stories from Indonesia. There are so many kind of places in Indonesia we struggle about uh, waters. Maybe if you visit to Sulawesi and Papua, there are so many struggle about it. Uh, there are many indigenous stories to reach out the waters. And it can be elaborated about the cultures and also elaborate about the local conflicts to reach out the waters and so many kind of stories about it and uh, there are also um, so many stories in the world uh, when we talk about uh, in my paper I stated but it's a uh, little bit the stories from uh, Japan and South Africa, water and NSU. This is a story about it. Okay, Lauren, thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Do you want to say maybe for that? Yes, I, I have uh, two things to say. One is on the chat, which is the sacred natural sites, which is uh, the United Nations, UNESCO more specifically, uh, uh, heritage custodians among indigenous people to take care of sacred natural sites. And this is a, a very important tool that I've been using with indigenous and, uh, to establish the defense of uh, sacred natural sites. So uh, we're talking about natural religious heritage here. Uh, so this is on the big level, but not to forget what Elizabeth has told us Very that I always ask my, 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 my teachers when I'm giving classes, please take your students out to visit the religious temples, to, vi to visit the natural, to visit uh, the, the watersheds and, and to take their, their religious need. It's, it's very simple, you know, visit. The church visit the indigenous shaman put them to talk take them to the watershed that is dirty clean it with the community it's you know it's it's uh it's like my my elder grandmother used to say before before you start talking my son please clean your room <laughs> you know it's like do do it you know and the kids are in need of doing and they really like it you know if you give them the broom they will clean it they really will they will. and and in england they have this this i'm a ranger because in, in england they they have this boy scout uh, nobility of cleaning the national parks and you become a ranger and kids really like it it's super cool to be a ranger you know it's like it's so you know, we got to get out there. We got to get out there and do it. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating in this session. Let's give a hand to Paulus and Felipe once again for their amazing presentations. And I also really enjoyed all of our conversation together.